Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the Jeffrey Tubin scandal. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So this is a sensitive topic, so I just want to issue that warning in advance here. I'll start with the background, and then I'll get to the analysis. So Jeffrey Tubin was born on May 21, 1960, in New York City. His father was a news broadcasting producer, and his mother had been a news correspondent. After he graduated from high school, he went to Harvard College and then Harvard Law School, graduating in 1986 with a Juris Doctor. That same year, he married a Harvard classmate. He worked as a law clerk and an assistant United States attorney before starting work with The New Yorker in 1993 and becoming a television legal analyst for ABC in 1996. Tubin became popular in part because of his analysis of the Michael Jackson trial and the O.J. Simpson trial. In 2002, he became the chief legal analyst for CNN. In 2008, he had an affair with another lawyer named Casey Greenfield. She became pregnant, and Tubin denied he was the father. A paternity test proved that he was, and he was ordered to pay child support. This takes us to October of 2020. Tubin was in a Zoom meeting with several staffers from The New Yorker. They were doing some type of election simulation, which involved role-playing. So simulation, not stimulation. It's easy to get confused in this context. At one point, when the people on the call were breaking into two groups, it looked like Tubin was taking another call. He lowered his camera, and when they did this, they saw that he was masturbating. He left the call, but then came back and acted like nothing happened. The incident was reported. Tubin would say that it was an embarrassingly stupid mistake. He believed he was off camera. He went on to say that he believed he was not visible on Zoom. He thought no one on the Zoom call would see him. He thought he had muted the Zoom video. The New Yorker suspended him, and he asked CNN for some time off to deal with a personal issue, which they granted. The reaction to this case has been fascinating. Tubin is a partisan figure. He's anti-Trump, a position he makes pretty clear. Not surprisingly, we see a partisan response. One side defends him, saying his actions were clearly unintentional, so there's really nothing to worry about. And the other side says that Tubin's behavior is part of a larger pattern of inappropriateness, and he should be held accountable. I think the evidence in this case supports that Tubin being visible on Zoom was unintentional. Looking at the question regarding his judgment, I think he was negligent to engage in that activity in front of what I assume was a laptop computer or smartphone. I think what happened here is that he used the same device to make or receive another call, a call designed to stimulate his interest, so to speak. So he pointed the camera toward a private region, I guess as part of that whole process. This was essentially multitasking, and just like all multitasking, it doesn't work out as well as people hope. Now, Tubin is a millionaire. He lives in a $2.7 million Manhattan apartment. He has published several books. Perhaps he should have simply invested in a separate device for taking care of business, so to speak. Now, he had some other options as well. He could have left the Zoom meeting. I don't think they would have fired him for that. He could have said, I need to go. Something popped up that I need to handle. He could have said, I'm afraid things will get out of hand if I stayed on the call. Or, I need to come to grips with myself. So really, there were many, many options available to Jeffrey Tubin. As I mentioned before, he went to Harvard, but given the details of the story, I thought maybe he went to the lesser-known college of Paul Rubens and George Michael. There he could have taken classes with very straightforward course titles that have no alternate meaning. For example, Raising the Mainsail, a course about boating. A Critical Review of Free Willy, a course about learning how to critique motion pictures. Understanding the Five-Digit Disco, a review of key metrics from the movie Saturday Night Fever. And One-Handed Typing, a class that helps somebody become more productive at work by freeing up one hand. I think that what Tubin did was negligent and certainly could have been frightening and disturbing to people on the Zoom call. I think what's important here is the call wasn't actually over. It was just shifting into a small group format. 
It wasn't like everybody said goodbye and he thought he clicked the close button, but he missed it, and then he went on with his day. That would be easier to understand. However, to be fair to Jeffrey Tubin, I do think that the stigma around masturbation plays a part in the reaction. If he accidentally transmitted video of himself getting undressed, I don't think people would have had the strong reaction. His mistake was keeping the Zoom call live and, I suppose, demonstrating an unusual work ethic. I mean, he could have waited till later to engage in that activity. Now, separating from the specifics of Jeffrey Tubin and moving to a general discussion, we see that masturbation has an interesting history as far as mental health. The activity is fairly common. 97% of men and 80% of women will engage in the activity during their lifespan. It is primarily conceptualized as something that compensates for a lack of partnered sex or low satisfaction in sex. Its frequency is positively correlated to educational level, sexual thoughts, depression, and physical vitality. It is negatively correlated with age. A number of religious belief systems condemn masturbation. For instance, some beliefs say that if people engage in it, they will burn in hell forever. This may lead to feelings of guilt and shame and can affect one's mental health. There's even a theory from years ago that masturbation leads to insanity. This is sometimes called the masturbatory hypothesis. The activity was thought to lead to psychosis and a number of physical health symptoms. Between 1885 and 1900, the understanding of the activity changed a bit to the idea that it caused neurosis, essentially an expression of high neuroticism, not a relatively permanent expression like from a personality trait, but in a temporary sense, like having depression, anxiety, and self-consciousness. A separate theory said that the neurosis came first, and then frequent engagement in the activity would follow. So there were different theories as to whether masturbation was the cause or the effect of psychopathology. The masturbatory hypothesis was ultimately abandoned. The research literature now indicates the activity is considered normal and healthy, although there is technically some amount of disagreement about potential health benefits. Now, even though masturbation isn't connected to a negative outcome, masturbatory guilt has been connected to mental health symptoms. But that's not really the activity itself, rather one's perception of the morality of the activity. This is actually a fairly common dilemma in the supervision of new counselors, like how to give advice to a client who is struggling with the desire to engage in this activity while maintaining a belief that condemns it. Really, there is no easy answer for that question. I think there are three lessons from the story of Jeffrey Tubin. One, whatever he accomplished in his life, graduating from Harvard, being on television, all that is now seemingly reduced to the guy that got caught giving himself a hand, so to speak. Second, there's a time and place for everything. I understand his defense, but there are certain activities that are perfectly acceptable in private, but completely unacceptable in a workplace, even if that is a virtual workplace. Third, being intelligent and having an education are not automatic protections against unwise actions. So those are my thoughts on the Jeffrey Tubin case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching. This is actually a fairly common dilemma that comes up when supervising. No, no, that, that won't work. This is actually a fairly common dilemma that arises. <laughs> that's not any better. <laughs> that's not. That's not any better at all. There he could have taken classes with very straightforward course titles that have no, no alternate meaning whatsoever. Like raising the mainsail. <laughs> of course, of course about boating. Like understanding the five digit disco. A review of key metrics from the movie Saturday Night Fever. And one handed typing. A clear reference to masturbation. <laughs> he could have said, look, I have to go. Something just popped up that I have to handle. <laughs> I'm really afraid things will get out of hand if I stay on the call. Or I really need to come to grips with myself. Many, he had many, many options in the situation. There he could have taken courses with very straightforward titles that absolutely have no alternate meaning. <laughs>